Hello, my well-being buddies. It's Steve, the mental health nurse, and today we're looking at insomnia. So the aim of this session, we're going to look at what insomnia is. We're going to look at some of the causes, some of the risk factors. We're going to look at some of the signs. We'll understand how insomnia is assessed, natural treatments for insomnia or sleeping problems, and again, some of the medication. So let's start off with by trying to understand what insomnia is. Now, from time to time, we all have problems sleeping and that's because we go to bed and maybe we've got a lot on our mind and our day mode. We just it's still there. We haven't switched over into an evening mode and we've not done our self-care routine. and We've not wound down. So it's left us in a bit of a high state of alertness. But insomnia means you regularly have problems sleeping. So in other words, we need to look at why that is uh, and what uh, can cause it. So things you can do to check if you have insomnia, uh, so some of the, the problems and some, some of the signs and symptoms that you're going to see is you find it hard to go to sleep. So you're laying there and it's just not, the brain's not turning off. You may wake up several times during the night. You may lay there and be quite a light sleeper. So you're... You can hear everything that's going on externally, not just your internal thoughts, but externally as well. You wake up early and you can't go back to sleep. You still feel tired when you wake up, so your body hasn't hit REM. So that's the rapid eye movement at night, and that's where your eyes do this. And then that's really important because if you don't hit REM properly, your data from that day isn't being stored into the memory bank. So when we sleep and our eyes flicker, that's the sign of REM. That means we're processing and forwarding information to the, to the brain. You find it hard to nap during the day, so even though you're tired, you might get irritable. Um, and again, you find it difficult to concentrate. So what we're looking for here is if you've had the insomnia for a short time, for less than three months, that's called short-term insomnia. And if you've had it for more than three months, that's long-term insomnia. Now you can go online, there's many um, assessment tools there to see and doing a sleep score is really important because it helps the assessment process and it helps us to understand how bad your sleep is. So before you go to your GP, before you start to talk to anyone about your sleep problems, do a sleep score assessment, see where you're at and see if you can improve it naturally without having to go to the GP. But if you have to go to the GP, then I fully understand. But you can try different things at home first. So first of all, how much sleep do we actually need? Well, evidence would suggest adults need between about seven and nine hours. Children, on the other hand, need a little bit longer. They need between nine and 13, and toddlers and baby between 12 and 17 hours. And that's just to do with those fundamental development stages and, and needing the sleep to grow, etc. The problem is, if we don't get enough sleep, we're constantly tired the next day. Our functioning, our e executive functioning is tired. It just doesn't work. And we're going to end up in problems. So what causes insomnia? Well, there's many things that can cause insomnia. Stress depression, anxiety, and we've covered those in other videos. So if you feel that you're low in mood for long periods of time, for more than two weeks, or you feel that constant adrenaline rush and that constant heart rate, then maybe there's some things that you need to address. Noise can keep us awake. And there's two types of noise there, isn't there? There's the external noise around us, so what's going on, but equally there's the noise in our head. Can we quieten it all down just to sleep? So we're, we're slowing that rumination, slowing that thinking down. Room temperature is really important. So it's not too hot, not too cold. Could be your bed. Maybe your bed's uncomfortable. Maybe you need to do a bit around that. Have you taken any diuretics? So are you drinking alcohol before going to bed? Are you drinking lots of coffee? Are you smoking? So if you're increasing the heart rate before going to bed, of course, that's going to keep you up. Are you taking any recreational drugs like cocaine or ecstasy? So anything that keeps you alert and up will definitely cause insomnia. It might be the fact that your work is um, making you jet lagged. 
Um, so again, if you're a flyer, you're doing lots of things like that, then jet lag is going to cause insomnia because of those poor sleep hygiene habits. Alternatively, maybe you're a night worker. And if you're a night worker, that's always a problem because, again, you're having to sleep through the day and our body is designed to kind of get used to this habit of sleeping. So what can you do really to improve this, a natural way of helping? Well, we call it good sleep hygiene habits. So good sleep hygiene habits looks at going to bed and waking up at the same time every day. So getting your body into a routine. About an hour before going to bed, you want to drop all the stimuli, lower the lights, get into a relaxing mood. And for example, that might be taking a warm bath, reading a book, but just low level stimuli. Maybe make sure your bedroom's nice and dark, use blackout curtains, use an eye mask if you need to, and earplugs if you need to kind of block that noise out throughout the day. It's important that you uh, exercise during the day, so burn off those extra, uh, that extra adrenaline, get rid of any excess energy so you're able to sleep and take your brain from day mode to night mode. And again, make sure your mattress is comfortable. So that's normally a memory foam or something, something that takes a bit of pressure off. And then those pillows. So we should be laying flat. We shouldn't be sitting upright on our necks bent. So nice, uh, nice relaxed uh, position. So good sleep hygiene habits are fundamental to a good night's sleep. And when I was in surgery, when I was talking to patients, a lot of the time they would go, Steve, I've got a problem with sleep and I can't sleep. We look at their sleep hygiene practices and they're terrible, but they're still arguing that they can't sleep. And trying to get people to understand this basic principle that we have our day mode brain and we have our night mode brain. We need to move our brain from day mode to night mode and we need to slow it all down. So in other words, don't smoke or drink before at least six hours before going to bed. Anything that increases your heart rate is going to keep you up. Try not to eat your big meal before going to bed because your digestive system is working overtime to digest the food that you've eaten. So maybe swap your main meals around, have a larger lunch and a light tea. Don't exercise at least four hours before bed because again, we have our adrenaline rush, then we go to neuroadrenaline and then we're burning that off and that can take a little bit of time. Don't watch TV or devices before going to bed because again, the bright light stimulates our, our brain, it wakens us up and it has the waking effect. Try not to nap throughout the day. Again, if you're sleeping throughout the day, of course you're not gonna sleep at night because the body hasn't used up what it needs to use up. Alternatively, you've rested and therefore your body doesn't need the sleep. Do not drive if you're feeling sleepy. Obviously, if you're tired, don't get behind the wheel of a car. And then the final other do nots is do not sleep in after a bad night's sleep and stick to your routine. There's no such thing as catch up with sleep. So it's important that if you've had a bad night, carry on, get up and get back to your normal routine. So how can I treat this naturally? Well, you can go to the pharmacy and you can look at things such as sleeping aids. You might try natural ingredients such as lavender or alternatively night oil or antihistamines. Again, you cannot cure insomnia, but hopefully you should see the improvement between one and two weeks. It shouldn't really take any longer than that. And equally, the moment you start taking products, there can be some side effects. So such as drowsiness and that hangover the next day. So be prepared for your drive-in and things like that so you're not impaired. Now, when do I need to go and see the GP? When do I need to get additional help? Well, that's if you've changed your sleeping habits and they haven't worked. There's no point going to see your GP if you haven't tried it first. Equally, you're having trouble sleeping for months, so you're in that long-term sleep deprivation bit. And insomnia is affecting your daily life and it's making you hard to cope. So what can your GPs do? Well, there's quite a lot of things that they can do now. So for example, they can look at um, prescribing you some stronger medication. So that might be uh, anything ending in the PAN family, um, 
Tamantapan might help you sleep or, or Zopiclone or any of those, uh, they might give you a night sedative. Again, you don't want to be reliant on them long term, but you might just want to do a small dose just to get you back into that routine. Equally, it may be worthwhile doing some cognitive behaviour therapy. So CBT will help to dial the brain down a bit, slow everything down and try to get to the bottom of your thoughts and behaviours that obviously forms part of your sleep problem. I have had some people say to me, but Steve, I get nightmares. I close my eyes and I get vivid nightmares. How can I manage those? And again, same thing. You can go to an IAP service, so the Intensive Psychological Therapy Services, explain to them that you're having nightmares and they can do night focus CBT to try to get to the bottom of what's going on. It might be the fact that you have sleep apnea, so you're having problems breathing during your sleep and that's then waking you up. So that's serious snoring um, or anything like that. So if you're having those problems, then you might need to be monitored and then the doctor can do a referral to the sleep clinics in the NHS services. Overall, doctors will rarely prescribe sleeping pills to treat insomnia because again, the side effects outweigh the benefit. So really, you do want to try as much as you can to get on top of this and to manage your insomnia in a normal, healthy way. So what we've covered then is we've covered what insomnia is. We've looked at the main causes. And again, it affects about one in three people. So this is a common condition. Cause of insomnia, poor sleep hygiene habits, stress, anxiety, depression. Some of the risk factors, we've talked about those going through driving, poor mood, poor concentration, risk to yourself. And again, if you're going to do medication, there's lots of side effects and risks there that you need to balance. So does the risk, does the benefit outweigh the balance, then the risk, sorry, does the benefit outweigh the risk? If it does, great. Some of the signs of insomnia we've talked about. So broken sleep, waking up at night, poor concentration, unable to focus. We've talked about how it's assessed. So again, um, we said you can go online and you can do a sleep score assessment or a sleep self-assessment. And if you Google that, you'll find those scales reports. And the GP will be grateful for that because you've given them some evidence based to go on. So natural treatments, we've talked about sleep aids, lavender, um, night owl, natural remedies, CBT and changing your habits around. And equally, we talked about the uh, medication that doctors can prescribe, such as the Zoppy clones and stuff. And ultimately they don't want to do that because they're fat, they're, they can form habits and we don't really want to put you in a position where you're forming more habits. And again, they can cause serious drowsiness and this hangover effect. The other thing is, uh, again, people then talk about, oh, can I have something prescribed if I'm going on a flight? I've, I've problems sleeping on a flight. And the, avi the aviation industry really have a problem with this. Ultimately, if you are in an emergency situation, you need to be able to respond. If you are taking sedative medication, it means that you are unlikely to respond effectively in an emergency situation. So we need to think about how that piece of work will will or how that uh, therapeutic approach will benefit you and the answer is it probably won't so i'm hoping that that's been useful my name's steve i'm the mental health nurse and i'll see you in another session take care bye for now